Welcome back folks. Today we're going to begin our look at factor markets and more specifically we'll look at what factors of production are. We'll be able to describe how the price of these different factors determines um, the demand for those factors and uh, we'll figure out how to calculate the pro profit maximizing um, level of factors particularly in the labor market. So that's our goal. Uh, the information is in chapter 20 of your book, Factor Markets and the Distribution of Income, and this is covering pages 510 to 519. So when we talk about markets, there's two different types of markets that, um, that we cover in this class. The first is product markets. That's for finished goods and services, and that's really what you've been looking at over the last several weeks. Um, all the different market structures, perfect competition, monopolistic competition, monopoly, oligopoly, those are all for product markets. The other type of market is what we call the factor market, and that's um, the market for the inputs and resources that go into making things. And uh, the factor markets are part of the circular flow diagram that we looked at at the beginning of the year. The goods market is the one that we're most comfortable with, and that's, again, that's what we've been studying, where um, the suppliers are those who make things, and the uh, demand is the consumer. But in the factor market, everything's kind of flipped backwards and reversed. So the, the people who are demanding the factors of production are the businesses, the producers, and the suppliers of those factors of production are assumed to be uh, the households. So things are going to be a little different than what we're used to, but, but not a lot. When we talk about factors of production, we're talking about uh, four main ones. The first is land. That's the resources that come from uh, nature to make things. The labor, which is the work done by people capital, which are the tools used to make the things um, that are, are then sold in the, in the goods markets. And that capital can be broken into physical capital, which is the tools and machines, as well as the human capital, which are your skills and your training. And finally, um, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurship, which is the talent or willingness to take a risk and bring resources together to try and create products that people are looking for. And all four of these factors of production are uh, essential to the creation of goods and services. When it comes to um, our demand for each one of these factors, we say that it's a derived demand, meaning um, the demand for each of these factors comes as a result of looking at the value that each additional unit of uh, input creates for the company and comparing it to the cost of that unit. And then um, using the same rule we've used pretty much all year long, which is basically that the marginal benefit of an additional uh, factor or additional, for example, additional worker has to be at least as equal to the cost of that worker in order for us to go ahead and consider employing it. And so our, our demand schedule or our demand curve for factors of production takes into account how much each factor creates in, in terms of dollar value, and then we can use that information and compare it to cost to see how much uh, to employ. So let me give you an example. Um, let's pretend in this world that we're trying to decide how many people to hire and so we've got uh, our number of options on the uh, left hand side. I could hire between zero and six workers. I'm going to look at their total product. That's the amount of goods that they each one can create. And then I'm going to um, derive or, de or derive the, the demand curve. So the first step is we need to look at how much uh, production, how many units of production each laborer creates. That's called the marginal product. In this case it's the marginal product of labor. And I see that the first worker creates eight units of production because we had zero before with the hiring of one worker we now have eight. When I hire two workers output goes from eight to eighteen. So that second worker added ten units of production. The third worker, we go from 18 total units to 26, so that third worker adds 8. The fourth worker is going to add 6, then 4, and 2. So we can see how much each, uh, how much production each worker can create. And we want to look and see what is what's known as the marginal revenue product. I want to see how much the additional product each worker creates is actually worth. So if I assume that we can sell this good at $2 per unit, then I would see that the first worker creates $16 worth of, um, worth of product. Right? His, he created eight units. I can sell each unit for $2, and so his work is worth $16 to me. The second worker created 10 units, and if I could sell all 10 units at $2 a piece, 
then I would say that his marginal revenue product is $20. The third created eight. If I sell him for $2 a piece, he's created $16 worth of benefit for me, and then we can work our way down the table. And so this is essentially our demand schedule. Um, and so I have to decide how many workers I want to hire. And so I look and I see how much their marginal revenue product is worth. And then I look to find where, so this is the marginal benefit. Now I'm going to look to see where the marginal cost equals the marginal benefit. Since each worker costs me an additional $8, that's my marginal cost. So I look and say, do I want to hire the first worker? Well, he brings in $16 and he costs me 8 So I've got an $8 profit. It's probably worth hiring that first worker. Second worker brings in $20 worth of work and he costs me 8 adds to profit. I think I'll hire him. Third worker adds to profit. Fourth worker adds to profit. The fifth worker brings in $8 worth of value and costs me 8 so I'm indifferent. So that looks like he's probably my best option. But let's just take a look. The sixth worker costs me $8 but only brings in 4 So that uh, adds to a loss for me. So I don't want to hire the sixth worker. And so I'll continue to hire workers until I get to the fifth employee and then I'll stop. So when it comes to determining how many units of one particular factor production to hire, we have the general rule that if my marginal revenue product is greater than the cost, in this case it's the wage rate uh, for a worker, then I'm going to go ahead and hire that worker. I'll stop hiring that worker when um, the marginal revenue product, the amount of money that's brought in, is equal to their wage rate. And I won't hire someone at all if the value they add to my company, their marginal revenue product, is less than what I paid, in this case, the wage rate. We can work through another example. Um, let's pretend in this case that um, we're trying again, trying to figure out how many people to hire, and we can see the total product that's created as I hire additional workers um, throughout. And so I've got my total product column, and then I can then determine my marginal product for each worker. Uh, so the first worker, we go from zero production to 19, so that first worker adds 19 units. When I hire the second worker, our total production is 36. We were at 19, and so that second worker is adding 17 units. The third is adding 15, 13, 11, and then on down. And then we need to determine the marginal revenue product. What's the value of the work created by each of these potential employees? And so the marginal revenue product, again, is the, the uh, value of the marginal product created. So if I can sell goods at $20 a piece, then the first worker is adding $380 worth of value to my company because he's creating 19 units at $20. He gets $380 coming into the company as a result of his work. And I can see then that each worker is producing subsequently a little bit less value per, for, the, uh, for the company because they're producing less output. So then how many workers... Uh, should I hire? Well, that depends on uh, the cost of labor. If the cost of labor is $200 per worker, then again, I look and say the, uh, the marginal benefit for the first worker is $380 to my company. He only cost me $200, so he's adding my profit. I'll hire him. The second worker also adds to profit. The third adds to profit. The fourth, the fifth adds to profit. But the sixth worker costs me $200, but only brings in $180, so he's essentially cost me $20 of loss, and that's not acceptable from a business standpoint, and so we stop at 5. This is the last point where the marginal benefit is equal to or greater than the marginal cost. And again, in terms of factor markets, the marginal benefit is referred to as the marginal revenue product. We can look at it on a graph, I and mean, these are just the coordinates that I showed you in the previous table just laid out on a graph where the vert vertical axis is the wage rate or the marginal revenue product and the horizontal axis is the number of workers I'm looking to hire. And so I look and see where if how many workers uh, there are if I connect all these pl uh, points together. Right? I say if $200 is market wage then I just come across until I hit the line and then work my way down and that tells me that five workers is my profit maximizing uh, number of employees. So one of the things that we can see about the marginal revenue product is that if the wage increases, then I'm going to hire fewer workers. I just move along this, uh, this demand curve, essentially. And if the wage falls, then I'll hire more. And that, again, sounds an awful lot like the law of demand, which we had in the, in the product markets, which says if the price goes up, I want less. 
and if the price goes down, then I would like to buy more. And so this, in fact, this marginal revenue product curve is our demand curve for the factors of production. Could be labor, could be land, could be capital. Um, they're all determined the same way. So just like all demand curves, there is this issue of shift versus movement. If there's a change in the wage rate, we just move along the demand curve. Just like with a change in price, we move along the demand curve. Anything else will cause a shift in the marginal revenue product curve. And the primary reasons why we might have shifts include a change in the price of the good itself, the price that we can sell the good at, um, the change in the supply of other factors of production, or some sort of change in technology which may make our workers more productive than they were before. And if we looked at each one of these factors a little bit more in depth, we'd see, for example, graphically, if there's a change in the price of the good, then um, let's say the price of the good goes up, then this fifth worker was producing $200 worth of value, but now the value is creating as much more because each unit that he creates can be sold for more. And so that would shift the, uh, shift the curve to the right um, for, for each worker. And, um, and then that would indicate an increase in our demand for labor. And if the price of the product went down, then again, that fifth worker um, was producing $200 worth of uh, product before is actually now producing less value because each product that he creates can be sold for less. And so there's a left shift in the demand for labor. If you look at it in a graph, in a chart, um, it's the same deal. I mean, if the price of the good is $2 and the wage rate is 8 then I'll hire 5 workers. But if the price goes up, uh, if I can sell each good for $4, then suddenly I'll want to hire um, 6. We look at uh, changes in the supply of other factors, um, the same kind of impact occurs. If I increase other factors such as uh, land, then each worker presumably will, be, will have more work space to, to um, to work in and that should increase their productivity or if I if I increase the number of machines then that would presumably increase the productivity of each worker if each worker can produce more stuff then the value they're creating for the company increases um, even if the price of the good remains the same so their marginal revenue product has grown uh, larger and so there should be a right shift in the uh, demand curve for labor and the opposite is also true. If I took away machines or I took away land, people would be less productive, the value of the work they create would reduce, and we'd have a left shift in the demand for, for labor or land or capital or whichever factor we're talking about. And finally, with technology, again, if technology gets better, I get more productive. If I'm more productive, then I produce more stuff, and that means more money for the company so that my marginal revenue product increases for each of the workers, and that would then be a right shift in the demand for workers. And so what we see is that technology changes actually will add jobs uh, to the overall economy. And there's a general fallacy that says technology takes jobs away. It's not really true in economic theory. We see that instead uh, changes in technology actually will create more jobs as it creates a demand um, for more labor. We'll talk uh, about this some more in class and uh, you'll have some problem sets to work through and I look forward to seeing you then.